Okay, welcome to week three. Um, we are going to be talking about the Norse. So remember the first week we talked about the natives, second week about Virginia or the southern colonies. Now this is the New England or northern colonies. Again, very, very different. Just like um, Virginia was based on slavery, um, New England's going to be based on religion. So um, a few things we're going to be doing in the beginning are difficult and um, just want to warn you about that. Um, and then um, the rest of today won't be that bad. And then the next video is all about everybody bad um, that was involved in New England, um, what's a bad Puritan, we'll talk about that, um, with witches and, you know, sexual offenders and all kinds of stuff. And also you're going to be a New England judge, which I think you'll enjoy. But anyway, so the New England or Northern colonies created a society based largely on their Calvinist beliefs. <clears throat> so let's do a couple of multiple choice just to kind of get you remembering what we did um, the last few weeks. So uh, which statement is true? This one's actually B. Remember, children of enslaved men it was women were born enslaved. Pocahontas was not fictional. Indentured servants were um, in, indentured, not really even enslaved for four to seven years because they could actually go to court. I didn't mention that before because it's just too much detail. But and it was who helped to populate Virginia. So it was D, all of the above. Three, what was a solution for Virginia's problem? So pay attention that solution was tobacco. All the rest are going to be um, part of the problems. Okay, so this is a reminder of the different solutions. Tobacco, indentured servants, slaves, and women. Remember, those are what are going to form Virginia. Okay, so again, based on um, got our thesis. And what we're going to do is do a short background in English history, which I'll ask you about. We'll talk, take a look at Calvinism. Normally we're drawing pictures and all that. Um, we're not going to do that, unfortunately, but I will have you do something similar. And then we're going to look at the New England colonies and what makes a good Puritan. Okay, so like I said, the first part's kind of hard, and then it'll go pretty fast after that. Okay, so this is King James I, and um, he actually came after um, Henry VIII and then Elizabeth, and then Elizabeth didn't have any kids, so now we have King James, and um, it was a different family. But anyways, as you can see, um, it says divine right of kings. So think about what that means. It's that um, God speaks through them, right? Can you tell he has a pretty good opinion of himself, right? So be thinking about that, divine right of kings. Okay, his son was Charles I, who also looks like he has a pretty, you know, good opinion of himself, right? Now, think about if our president never called Congress or Obama or any of the previous presidents didn't call Congress. Well, that would be a big, big problem. And that's exactly what Charles I did. He didn't call Parliament. Um, and that was made up of pilgrims and Puritans. So they didn't like that at all. They thought that was really wrong. And I think he didn't call them for 12 years. So that's like three different presidents, right? And so what they ended up doing, it's the only time in their history that they did this, they beheaded him. So um, there's his head down, down on the bottom. And the guy that took over was Oliver Cromwell. Now, Oliver Cromwell was a Puritan. And we're going to see that they're pretty, you know, strict people. So take a look at this if you can read it. Let me read it to you. The observation of Christmas having been deemed a sacrilege, in other words, like a sin, the exchanging of gifts and greetings, dressing in fine clothing, feasting, and similar satanical practices are hereby forbidden, with the offender liable to a fine of five shillings. So he's calling giving gifts, dressing nice, even celebrating Christmas satanical. So these people are really, really serious, and uh, people kind of got tired of him. So he did end up dying. Um, they ended up, I believe, digging his body up and um, hanging him or something. They didn't like him at all. But what they did is the English invited back um, Charles the first um, son. Now, why couldn't they invite back Charles I? Because he was dead, right? So Charles II learned from his dad's mistakes, and he did um, obey Parliament, and he limited monarchy, limited power, but he also reopened the theaters and dancing and music. So what I want you to think about is how, what position are the Puritans and Pilgrims in right now? They killed his dad, right? So they want to get out of there, and that's exactly why they left. Okay, so the, what I want you to do for question one is please describe how the Pilgrims and Puritans came to America and explaining the role of the following. Again, just need what you do in lecture. Don't do um, anything else. Okay, so it's James I, Charles I, Oliver Cromwell, and Charles II. Okay, so the Pilgrims and Puritans decided to come to America. And I don't know if this is really accurate, but the Puritans were, you know, did feel they were kind of superior and were strict and inflexible and authoritarian. Pilgrims, so hopefully, a little bit nicer. About half of them died, though. They, about 100 came here and 50 died right away. So, you know, they were pretty reliant on the natives. We're not going to talk much about the Pilgrims. We're going to focus on the Puritans. But both of them were what were called Calvinists. Let me close my window. 
So I don't know why there's always loud noise whenever there's planes or helicopters or garbage trucks <laughs> always every time I'm trying to do this. But um, Calvinist, um, Calvinism is going to really form the basis of Puritanism. And it's extremely important to understand to know why would they, you know, execute witches? You know, why are they kicking out people who are supposedly, you know, sinful, whatever? And so normally we do this whole thing right. I explain this um, to all these um, points. And then I give each group a piece of paper and they have to draw a picture of what, how you would explain this to a child. So I'm going to do a variation on that. So please, you know, try to figure out how would you explain this to a child? My belief, and I think this is really true, is that if you can explain things to a child, you really truly understand it. So let me go through each point. This is what's called TULIP. Did you notice the first letter of each um, phrase? T-U-L-I-P. And there still are people in America that believe this. They're called Reformed. Um, it's kind of like a like, you know, you can be Democrat or Republican, you can be Calvinist or what's called Armenian. So it's just a variation on Christianity. So what is total depravity? And make sure, again, you take some notes. Total depravity is the belief that everybody deserves to go to hell. Yep, simple as that. Unconditional election means that God is choosing one person or several people, but it's not based on how good they are or how bad they are. It's just he just chooses them. Limited atonement's a little bit harder to understand. Um, what most Christians believe is that Jesus died for everyone and that you need to ask for his you know, forgiveness and ask to accept his gift. What the Calvinists would say is it's all about what God chooses to do. So what they believe is that Jesus only died for people who are chosen, which again, a lot of Christians don't believe that, but that's what they believe. So again, that Jesus only died for those who... Um, who are chosen. Again, you guys, I'm available. Just don't put this off to the last minute, okay? But if you ask me early on in the week, I can hopefully explain it more if you're confused, okay? I know it's very hard. And like I said, these are the two things that are actually some of the hardest we'll do all semester, to be honest. Okay, irresistible grace means that God chooses you and you cannot resist. It's not your choice. God chooses you, you cannot resist. And then perseverance of the saints. Saints is not like the Catholic saints were special people. Saints is considered what a Christian is. And the Bible actually uses saints quite a bit. But perseverance of the saints means you will make it to the end um, if you are chosen. You will make it to the end if you are chosen. Okay, so hopefully you've got those. Let me go over it one more time. So total depravity, everyone deserves to go to hell. Unconditional election, God chooses some, but it's not based on if they're good or bad. It's totally his choice. Limited atonement, Jesus only died for those that were saved. Irresistible grace, um, that you cannot resist if you are chosen. And perseverance of the saints, basically it's very similar. You, um, to irresistible grace, that you will persevere, you will make it to the end um, if you are chosen. Okay, so what I need you to do is how would you describe TULIP to a child? Please leave out your personal beliefs and bias here. I don't really need to hear a sermon on if you think this is arrogant or whatever. The, our goal as historians, right, is to, um, is to d just understand them, right? Yes, the Puritans believe their children need to understand this point, so we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, it's, it's a hard one, you guys. It's a hard one. I know it is. Okay, so there won't be that many questions, though, for this. Now, let's talk about the Puritans and see what can we learn about New England from this picture. We're actually almost done, believe it or not. So um, this one says, come over and help us. So it's a native. They put him in the middle of the Massachusetts Bay Seal. And what was their attitude? That they needed to go and help the natives, that the natives were calling to them. Okay, this, I'm going to um, break this down for you, but this is a song, a Puritan song. And we're, think about Virginia first and how we're going to compare it. So look at this. And what do we see here that would not be in Virginia? I know we didn't stress it totally, but there's women and then there are families. So in Virginia, people came as um, indentured servants. They came single people, and there were not that many girls. Remember, um, we had to have the... Um, the, the boatload of, you know, free women coming over. So they're, and they came again as single. At the New England, they come as families. So they're much more, um, you know, equal with men and women. Okay, here's another one. How is this different from Virginia? Okay, remember what I said about skills in Virginia? They didn't really have a lot of skills, but look what these guys are. Blacksmiths, cobblers, weavers. They came with very, very practical skills. They also came with their own contract um, where they were in charge. Remember with Virginia, it was the other people who were charged and did this whole communal system, which didn't work out very well. 
All right, here's First America's first book. Um, everybody in um, New England, most of them were literate, 90% of the men, 50% of the women. So normally it'd be about 50% of the men were literate, but in New England, everybody's literate because they're reading the Bible, they're reading sermons, um, they're reading pamphlets. Okay, so um, here with the children's primary, this just shows you that I really wasn't kidding that they are teaching their children this stuff. So remember, um, so we have like, remember A is for Ariel, B is for Bell, C is for Cinderella. That's not what they get. In Adam's fall, we send all heaven to find the Bible mine. Christ crucified for sinners um, died. Um, let's go on. Um, J, Job fills the rod yet blesses God. L, Lot fled to Zor, Safari, Shara, on Sodom poor. I mean, they are not fooling around, right? Okay, this is a picture of a woman that was over 100 years old. So think about, um, and again, you're going to need to use these pictures in a minute for an activity, but um, how would what is represented in this picture affect New England society? Well, if somebody is super, super old, right, and people are not dying, you're going to have a ton of kids. Remember, the average age was 80. So think about there's going to be a lot more authority, you know, a lot more older people. This would be a typical family. I mean, lots and lots of people. So um, what we're going to find later is that, you know, they want to have their own farms. They want to divide with their children. But, you know, there's so many kids that are living that they need to send them west. I mean, things just um, change because there's so many people. <clears throat> so use, using three of the preceding pictures, 3A, B, C, D, and N or E, how would you describe Puritan life? Okay, now what you're going to do is you're going to go, um, we're going to go to a primary source. According to John Winthrop and the Puritans, what does it get Puritan and what happens when people sin? I'm going to explain it to you and then I want you to go find out for yourself. But this is absolutely crucial to understanding these Puritans. So first off, they consider themselves a city upon a hill, that everyone is watching them. They are role models. Okay, so later on you guys are going to be doing an analytical paper where you're going to take four different primary sources, three different primary sources, sorry, and you're going to create an argument. But you need to understand, this is super, super important to understand what, their, what they believe their role is. So they think that everybody's watching them, that they are a role model. Uh, the pilgrims, by the way, were called separatists, and they didn't want anybody just to bug them. The Puritans thought, that, hey, we are you know, pure, we are the role model. And what it's saying is that if they deal falsely with God, that he's going to withdraw from them and that they're going to become a kind of a joke out the world. The enemies will be able to speak evil of them. And we're going to shame the faces of God's servants and their prayers are going to turn into curses until we are consumed out of the good land. So think about that, you guys. This is extremely important. So, you know, how could you not let a sinful person, you know, what happens if you have a sinful person in your midst? You've got to get rid of that person because God is going to turn from, from you. He's going to turn his back on you. And everybody's going to laugh at you and everything, you're going to be consumed and you're going to become a curse. So they took it very, very seriously that they were chosen and that they were a role model. That's why the Calvinism is so important. So what is a good period and what happens when people sin? Please use two quotes and analysis from John Winthrop's sermon. Okay, that actually is it, you guys. I told you, today's kind of heavy. And then next week, uh, next time will be um, kind of more fun because we'll talk about witches and stuff like that. So the New England and Northern colonies were largely guided by their Calvinist beliefs. Hopefully you can see that. And we talked about the background in English history. Remember, that's English royal history over in England. Calvinism and what is a good Puritan. Next time, we'll talk about what is a bad Puritan and how did the Puritan lifestyle not work for the Native Americans. And then you're also going to do a trial where you're going to be the judge, which I think you really like.